analytically, because now we have our integrals, you can also get it with some kind of integration by parts of the, of the correlators. And then you will get the Schwinger Dyson equation, but it's actually exactly the same that you get combinatorially. And uh, this is what you use to later produce the, the topological recursion. So we will start with the, with the combinatorial part. So the idea is that we want to build bijections of different sets of maps. So we want to take our maps and remove the first edge of the first boundary and see which are all the possibilities. So we will build some bijections that will translate algebraically into some uh, relations between the generating series. Okay, this is the idea of uh, what the touch recursion does. I'm calling it touch recursion because this method was originally um, invented by, by Tat in the 60s, and that's how he solved uh, the, th the, the, um, the planar case. But uh, actually, he never did higher genus. Um, okay. So f I want to start with this guy. This is the generating series of maps with fixed length and genus G. So I want to take any map. And this is the first boundary. Um, yes, I, take, I took the convention that the boundary sits on the left of the root. So this is okay, this is the first boundary. And now we want to separate all the possible cases of what, what is this guy. So the first guy, uh, in the first case that we will treat, this will be just an interior phase of length G. So we can call it Jagon. I was calling them yesterday. And uh, you remove it. We find something. So what has changed from here? Here we had the boundary of length L1. And now this goes to a boundary of length L1 plus J, so something that is longer because we, had, we have added this, uh, plus J minus two. And minus two is because I removed this, this guy. And uh, remember that I'm counting half edges, so I'm actually removing two. And also there is a canonical way of routing the, the new guy, let's say. So we should just take a convention so we can just say that this is the previous one in the boundary, okay? But you can take any convention, it will work. So okay, this tells us that this generating series will be equal to the corresponding term. So I want to sum, oh sorry, why am I putting a minus? <clears throat> we want to sum over all possible um, Length of this jagon. Okay, so actually here I took my old convention, not the convention from yesterday. I will try to fix it on the way. So I, uh, what I'm saying is that I was only allowing these jagons to be of length from three to d yesterday, if you remember. This is not how I wrote it down in my in my notes, but should be fine hopefully. So here we obtain uh, something that has one less jagon, that's why I'm adding this t, and that has length L1 plus j minus two. And it has the same genus. So okay, it's equal to all these possibilities plus, and then we have to figure out if there are other possibilities here. You can probably imagine that there are many more possibilities, but well, not many. Don't be scared. Actually, there are four more possibilities, three more possibilities, depending on what you define as possibility. This Schwinger. 
or if you pronounce it at the, in the English way, Schwinger, I guess. <laughs> Okay, then the next possibility is quite similar to this one. But we want that this is also a boundary now, because just, just because this is another possibility, right? So this is a boundary of length um, L1. Okay, let me denote of length L1 with an arrow. And uh, this is another boundary, so we need to say which one, because okay, this is uh, always the first one, but this one can be any. So it's a boundary uh, of length Li for i different from 1. Now if we remove it, so this time I didn't draw any genus, but it, there could be genus, there could be anything. If we remove it, we get something very similar as before. We just get that the first boundary now has length, again, L1 minus, sorry, plus Li minus 2. Okay? And then we also take the convention that we mark the previous one, but we also, rem we also forget which one was uh, marked in here. And this is important for the, for the algebraic relation that we get. So this plus now goes here. We just need to add all the possible boundaries from 2 to n. And then we multiply by, the, by Li. And this tells us where this was uh, marked. And we just put what we need to put. OK, sorry. This has first L1 plus Li minus 2. And uh, no, and then of course we want it to have the same number of boundaries minus one. So the Li is not there anymore. Okay, is this clear? Are there problems? No. Okay. Uh, there are other possibilities. These two last possibilities will give us the terms that already look a little bit like the topological recursion terms. You can already recognize them because you already saw the formula of the topological recursion. So we have something like this. This is the first boundary. If we remove this guy, we get an extra boundary because this guy gets disconnected. And uh, we reduce the genus by one. Okay, this is the case, the case in which these two guys are connected. Okay, so we just get this thing. And again, there is a canonical way of uh, marking the new two boundaries. So there is no problem in this for our bisection. Now this has genus G minus 1. Okay, so this goes from n boundaries of length L1 and uh, 
from other elves. This is the the tuple of the other boundaries, the, the tuple of the length of the other boundaries. And then here we will have n plus one boundaries of length. Okay. J so J to be anything. L1 minus J minus 2. So this is the two uh, things for here. So they have to add up to L1 minus 2. Okay, because we just removed two half edges. And the rest stays the same. And then algebraically, this gives us the following type of terms. In which one? In number two? This is number three. Yeah, this, uh, this guy, you have to count it twice. So, okay, if you sum uh, all this length and all this length, and then you remove this, you are removing this uh, twice. So it has length one on one side and length one on the other side. So if you sum these two lengths, you will have the sum of the lengths minus two. Okay. And actually the idea of the minus two is the same in every picture. Okay, and then I have to write the generating series that corresponds to this, right? So maybe let's do it like this, the three, for the for the touch recursion in the generating series is just the sum for all possible j's until l minus two, and then it has to have a boundary of length j, another boundary of length l one minus j minus two. We just put them the two of them at the beginning. Why not? And then the rest of the boundaries stay the same, and the genus is reduced by one. Okay. Then let's do the fourth type of term. And uh, yeah, actually this guy we will need it. This sum we'll need, we will need it for the next thing as well. So I remove the parentheses, but don't get stressed. There are things coming. Um, so the other possibility is the disconnected case. It's the same, but in which the result is disconnected. Sorry that I'm losing some artistic motivation, but probably by this point you can guess very well. Okay, so in this case we had a genus and we had uh, some, um, what am I labeling? Some boundaries in here labeled by a set I and another set here J. And then here we will have a new thing that has a genus G minus eight and eight. And eight goes from zero to to G. Okay, why am I drawing genus? I don't know. <coughs> then this one has n boundaries of length L1 and the set L. And this one has one, because of this one, plus the cardinality of I boundaries. And this one has one plus the cardinality of J boundaries. That's it. So in total, we will have N plus one boundaries. And these boundaries have lengths J 
i. So i is the, um, is the tuple of the length of these boundaries. And here we will have lengths L1 minus J minus 2 and the tuple J. Okay? So uh, this corresponds, and this is the term number 4, to this sum. So we sum over H from 0 to T. And then we sum over all possible I's inside L. And we have maps with uh, one extra boundary of length j, j, and the rest of the boundaries uh, stay, stay the same. Oh, sorry, this is not L, this is I, of course. OK, so now I'm, this is the generating series for just this component. OK, we are in the disconnected case, so that's why we will get a product, as in the topological recursion formula. And this guy has length L1 minus J minus 2, and the rest stays the same, which is L minus I, which is equal to J. Okay, and then the genus, oh, and this is wrong, sorry. We, we need to distribute the genus, as I said. Oh, and I did it the other way around. So this is G minus 8, and this is 8. Okay, and this closes this parenthesis because here I was summing from all possible, so for all possibilities of J, and I still have to do it here. Are there questions? That's a good idea. <laughs> so, okay, I'll let you reflect a little bit while I erase this. So now we have our complete touch recursion, at least at the level of the Fs. Yes. This Li? Yes. That's a tricky one. So to go from here to here, I kept saying that um, when we erase this one, we are erasing the root. And we want uh, our map to still have a, a first boundary. So we root it in a canonical way. So we don't have to take into account that in the bijection because it's taken care of. But this other boundary, in this case, is not. We don't remember where this was marked. So we need to multiply by all the possibilities of marking the other face that is on the other side. Yes. So, for example, in, in the first picture, that means that actually the shaded part is a sphere, and then you put something else. Exactly. And similarly, like, for example, in number three, that means that you have a sphere in the shaded bit, and so you have, like, a genus, and you're, like, you're decreasing the genus, so... Yes, this, like is, this is a, a good question, because here you have, the, you have to imagine that the, the whiteboard is... Uh, Closed. Uh, the yes. sphere, so okay. But in here, you get two spheres. Right. Otherwise, it doesn't have the right topology. Right. This uh, guy. And we wanted to have the topology of the disk. So okay. this is what happens here. And also here, you have two spheres. So you have two different maps so disconnected. That's why you get the product. Okay. So yeah, exactly. And the i and j are just counting the number of roots that you have? The number of uh, marked uh, exactly. edges, yes? Exactly. It's the tuple of lengths of the other boundaries that are not the first one. So the, the okay. these are the first uh, 
cardinality of I ones, and these are the, the rest. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. More questions? No? Okay, so now uh, I gave you how the touch recursion looks like when we fix the lengths. But we are actually interested in uh, letting the length be anything. So we want to sum over all possible lengths, multiply by the denominators with the x's, if you remember from yesterday, to build our correlators, and then see what we get at the level of these uh, w's, okay? And this formula, I will write it directly. Uh, excuse me, Elba. Yes? Uh, I will probably annoy you a little bit, but this recursion is valid only if the allies are large enough to and we move Yes, I, yes, I'm hiding some little details, yes. So you can figure those by, by yourself, <laughs> maybe tomorrow if you want, <laughs> yes. But those are easy, you just have to think of them okay. apart. In number three, can you say again what the L minus two on the top of the sum is? Like what's, what's L with no index? Sorry, I'm not hearing you very huh. well. In sum three. Ah, ah this one? Mm. Yes, because uh, remember that when we sum these two guys, they can be at most L1 minus 2. So this is L1 in the equation. L ah, yes, yes, yes. Ah, this is your question. Okay, yes, sorry. So L1 minus 2, yes. <laughs> okay, very good. You are very sharp with the details, so that means that you're understanding. Um, so let me now write um, what happens at the level of the correlators. So we actually want to apply an operator that looks like this. Just taking the sum over all possible lengths. Let's say, well, we can say zero, but we said yesterday that that case is almost trivial. And then we put something in here and we just put the right denominator that keeps track of the length of the boundaries. So we want to apply this guy to all our equations. If we apply it to the first term, the one on the left hand side, we just find our correlator multiplied by x1, okay? This you have to remember from yesterday, the definition of the WGN that was just exactly the application of this operator. Okay, this is what is in the left hand side. But now I will put, I will put more, more stuff to make my life easier. Um, so I will also want to put, hmm. okay, let's try like this. This you can check all the details. There are some terms that are a bit difficult, so I don't expect uh, people who have never done it to see them directly. I will just leave that as a, as a work for you to complete. So this whole guy is now uh, V prime of X1 times W G N X1 X N. So I should probably remember what V is. I have to have a bit of patience because I'm not even writing the equality yet, but it will be there. I'm just writing in the way that it will be easier for me to manipulate afterwards, otherwise I have to write it many times, and it takes a lot of time. And uh, so yeah, I remind you what uh, this uh, V is, so V, well, or V prime directly. So V prime is just X minus uh, yeah, now I'm mixing the notation from yesterday. Did I make? Oh, no, I made it uh, already correctly. Okay. Uh, X to the J minus one. Okay, if you remember yesterday, I defined the potential. This is just the derivative of the potential, so you can uh, remember.
Yes. OK. Uh, so you can observe that here you, we, we just, uh, this, uh, this equality is true. So uh, if you are uh, checking this term just from this guy, you will observe that in that term there are too many things. OK? Because remember that in the Ws, everything is in the denominator. You don't have anything uh, that is of a positive um, exponent in, in x. So and in here, this can happen, right? Because this just starts with uh, 1 over x1. So it can be that this guy is bigger, and then it will give uh, positive things. So we want to remove this to get the right thing. And when we remove this, we call this p from polynomial, because this is just a polynomial. This is quite important. And this polynomial is just what I said, removing the right thing, which is just removing from this guy the things that are positive in x1. OK, and then note it like that. Very good. And now I will put my equality. OK? So, so far I did until here. I just put this guy on the other side and did these little manipulations. So it's good. I can arrange this one already. So on the other side, I will just put this one. And this one, I guess you will not understand why I get this thing, because this one is a bit complicated. But I, I just leave it as an exercise to not lose time with something that is just some combinatorics. Or maybe if you are. Um, used to these things, you will see immediately why you get this type of thing. But when I was learning this, for me, this was substantially the worst term. So don't be too scared. So now I need to tell you what to put in here. I just write it downstairs. Oh, well. This guy is just the same guy, just without the x1. OK? So this just comes from number two. And then I put the other two terms. And these ones are very easy to get. So you can think of them while I write. We just need to put topology, the right topology, g minus 1, n plus 1. And then the same variable, we. Because this came from the same boundary. That's why. And then the rest. And the last one, you need to sum over all possible topologies. This is what we were doing here. And then when you do, when you add the x's in the denominator, you can see that you can arrange them in a, in a nice way. So it just gives you the product of the correlators with the split topologies, let's say. So something that looks very similar to the terms in topological recursion. OK, now these guys are uh, just a partition in two of the x's, of the set of x's. And then this, this just has uh, g minus h, yes? 1 plus i boundaries. It's just x1 and i. And on the other one, we have h1 plus j, cardinality of j, and x1 j. OK, and we are done. This is our final touch recursion. Are there questions? OK. So now we want to solve this. And uh, topological recursion was not the first, uh, I mean, we, we want to solve this recursively in the topology, right? 
So uh, we will first solve it for 0, 1. And this will give us the spectral curve. And this was not done uh, for the first time by topological recursion. But the method of topological recursion has even very nice things for this very classical problem. So um, there are various things. One is that we will go from this recursion that was already before, was there already before, from a recursion, from the topological recursion that has many less terms, okay? We will only see in the end three and four, as you can imagine. Uh, so if you want to see properties of your maps, for example, if you are doing like critical exponents of maps or something like that, it's very nice to get rid of all these other nasty terms because you don't have to take care of those with topological recursion. That is one nice thing. The other thing is that whatever you will check for your problem that you care about, if you do it with topological recursion, you will probably get something that is more universal. For example, again, if you do this, this study of behavior of criticalities directly with the formula of topological recursion, you will probably so be able to apply to other problems because the method is universal and it works in many cases. And uh, apart from that, it gives a very nice explanation of uh, something that is called the rationality scheme in combinatorics. And I will tell more about that later. I'm just saying this little comment for the experts in maps. So should I uh, start with disks? Maybe here, this is fine. So now we will solve for disks and we want to find our spectral curve, so we will also solve for cylinders. And finally, we want to find the formula of topological recursion. So how to do that? This can be called uh, part four, I think. And sorry that I'm using the, type, the same type of things. Maybe I can call it square here. And I should maybe change pen. He didn't like it. Okay. So now we do disks. So we just write our touch recursion for the case gn equal to zero, uh, to gn equal to zero one, sorry. And we find the next, uh, the following thing. We find that there is a polynomial relation between x and W01 of X. So this will just give us the spectral curve. So this tells us a uh, first nice thing, and is that the generating series of disks is algebraic, actually. So because uh, remember that this is a um, formal power series. So we just proved that it's algebraic because this is a polynomial. So this is very nice because actually we kind of transformed a problem that had infinitely many uh, unknowns into a new problem that has only finitely many unknowns, which is finding this P01. If we find P01, we compute it, omega W01. Okay, so let's do this. This is very easy. This is just the formula from high school. To solve a quadratic uh, equation. Okay, first observation, we have two, br two branches um, as a solution, but we want to take this one. Why? Well, because uh, right now it's the only one that gives us a hope that this can work. Because remember that this starts when x is large. I mean, the, the, the definition in the, of this guy, you can see that this starts with one, uh, u over x. u was the parameter that was keeping track of the vertices. So this is the first guy. And uh, if we don't pick the minus, we will never be able to kill the leading terms in this uh, polynomial of in here. Why? Because maybe it's not, uh, yeah. 
maybe it was not super clear from what I said, but if you see the definition of P, P01 is this guy over here. This one starts with U over X. So this one will have, uh, so the whole thing will have degree at most the degree of this guy minus one, okay? And the degree of uh, V prime is D, by the way, is D minus one. Sorry, D was the degree of V. Yes, so uh, I was saying that uh, the degree of P01 is at most D minus two. So it will never kill uh, this, uh, this guy if we pick the, the plus. If we pick the minus, we, can, we manage to find a solution. But we don't know much more right now. So okay, what can we do? For the moment, this guy was just a formal power series in X. And, and then we said that is algebraic, okay. But uh, can we do something more? Well, actually we can. We know that this guy is well defined around infinity. But we can actually analytically continue it. And it's not so bad. It just has some square root in here. So what is the worst that can happen? Actually, if we just um, take the roots of this polynomial in here, this uh, guy has degree 2d minus 2. And we just expand it. We call the roots ai. So this guy has degree uh, 2d minus 2. Um, then the worst that can happen is that we have cuts going from one uh, of these zeros to the other, okay? So we have these cuts, but in the rest of the plane, this is okay. So if we want to analytically continue the, the omega to the whole plane, it will not be okay, it will be multi-valued. We cannot analytically continue to the whole plane. But we can analytically continue to, to a lot of plane, so we, sh we should just avoid these uh, cuts that come from the square root, okay? It will, it will take some time to see the exact structure, but probably you saw these things in many occasions in other cases, so it doesn't sound too unreasonable. And now we want to see what happens exactly. And what happens is even better than that. That is uh, the worst scenario that we have now that is not so bad. And then what actually happens is even better. So what we do is, okay, now our, uh, now our object is multi-valued in here, in the whole plane. But we want to uh, find a cover in which it's uh, not multivalued. So this is what we do. We define a Riemann surface. And this will be a cover of that one. Just as the zeros of our polynomial. We may need to compactify it. This will be a cover of CP1, and this will be our X, okay? So one little remark is that if the number of cuts is the worst that can be, that is uh, D minus one, then the genus of this Riemann surface would be at most D minus two. Okay, and this is uh, just very intuitively what happens is that we are taking a double cover that is this Riemann surface. So for example, if it has three cuts, the genus will be two. Okay, just for you to have an intuitive idea of what ha what's happening, this is a ramified double cover. of the Riemann sphere. 
Okay. So now let's uh, study more what, what happens. The next thing that one needs to prove, I will not prove it actually, because it's a bit technical and doesn't give too much at this stage, I would say. But what we need to prove is that there is actually only one cut. This is what uh, often in, in physics people call the one cut assumption, but it's actually not an assumption. It's something that you can prove. And uh, apparently in combinatorics it was sometimes called uh, Brown's lemma. So what this tells us, one cut slash Brown's lemma, is that actually the thing, the discriminant, uh, only has two poles that are sim two zeros that are simple, and uh, the rest are just paired two by two. And this eliminates all the cuts except one. So this is just of the following shape. Sorry, there is a four in here. Oh, I didn't write the four. Sorry. So there exists an M that is uh, this big factor to the square, and then the two simple zeros that we call A plus A minus. So actually all these cuts are not there, and this will be A plus A minus. And then we can write A plus and minus as some alpha, well, this expression with some alpha and some gamma. And these guys are just <coughs> power series. Oh, actually, not in this formalism. They are just polynomials. No. Are they polynomials? Well, they are at worst, at worst power series in the T's. But maybe they are polynomials in the T's and power series in the U? Yes, okay. Yes, usually I just get rid of the U and do the more general case in which you also include these uh, phases of length one and two and then you have to treat it a bit differently but this case is a bit better bit less technical. So it is just a power series in U, which is the variable for the vertices. And polynomial in the T's. Okay. So now uh, we have our guy omega zero one that looks like this. We have shown actually with the, with the lemma that uh, our Riemann surface has geno zero. So it has to have a rational parameterization. And you can actually find a very nice one that allows you to write this just as a rational function. And then this is very, very nice because we turn our algebraic uh, function into now a rational function. So for this we need a new uh, variable and this is what is given by the x. Now our uh, z, our new coordinate, lives in the Riemann sphere. Okay? So what we call Y is just the rest of the W01. And this is a rational function of Z, and you can actually show that it has this shape. It takes uh, just little work, but I'm not doing the details of why this is of this shape. And this is the spectral curve of this case. 
So, okay, important things. Now we showed that with this parameterization, this is a rational function in Z. This, with this parameterization, this is actually just something very easy in Z, and that's why this turns this into a rational function. Okay? And this is what I was saying before that is uh, important in combinatorics. This is what is called uh, the rationality scheme. And actually, this uh, alpha and gamma have a combinatorial interpretation that I will not be able to explain, but. It's a, it's a nice combinatorial interpretation in terms of mobiles. That are these uh, things that are in bijection with maps and that are extremely useful. Um, so these type of structures suggest something very rich at the level of combinatorics. They suggest that these complicated maps are actually built of smaller pieces that we can control very well. And well, this has to do with this combinatorial interpretation that I'm putting under the carpet. carpet. But it's very nice that our generating series is a rational function in this variable that we understand in this way. And the good thing of topological recursion is that it gives you for free, if you prove that your problem satisfies topological recursion, it gives you for free that this happens for any topology. This is not something easy to prove at all, in, in with just, just with combinatorial tools, I would say. So this is uh, something nice. So okay, let's describe a little bit more the spectral curve so we can work. So okay, maybe I should do the, the picture of the, of the transformation. So what this has done is opening the cut, doubling our thing, and sending the exterior of the, of the cut to the interior in here. It sends the, the a minus to minus one, the a plus to one, and well, it has doubled the thing. Maybe it's easier to, to see if I draw it like this. Okay, this was our guy, that, like this one, but it's obtained zero because we showed that there is only one cut. So these are spheres, they, they are three dimensional. <laughs> and then here we have opened the cut. So this has turned into this double cover, okay? Here we have sigma plus. Sigma minus, and this is sigma plus and sigma minus represented in here. Yeah. So this is the the, the idea of what the x does. Then we should compute the ramification points. Okay, they are easy, but there are, there are two of them. We just get one minus one over z squared equal to zero. And they are just plus and minus one. Okay. And what else do we need? We need the involution around each ramification point. Well, in this case, it's very easy. And it's even a global involution. We can just send z to one over z. This, the x stays the same. So the involution is just one over z. So okay, remember that what happens locally is that around each ramification point, the x looks like a square root. A is our ramification point, or maybe let's call it R, Ooh. because A had to do with the cut, and it has nothing to do with that, or well, little. And around the ramification point, we have these two preimages of every point that go to the same z, to the same x. Sorry. Okay. This you probably understood already quite well from Bertrand's lecture because this is what happens in general for the classical topological recursion. So okay, I will say very little about cylinders, but cylinders are very nice. 
because here we are in topology 0, 2, and it's where we get the Bergman kernel, which is the universal object. So the very cool thing is that the generating series in the sets that we found is universal. So what do we mean by this? We mean, well, you, you already saw a lot of uh, why this object is nice in Bertrand's lecture, um, but at the level of maps, at least, the very nice thing is that this guy looks the same for any type of maps, any type of internal structure, even for many maps that with decorations, you see the same object in the sets. Something that is very simple, that is attached to, to just the, the Riemann surface that we got as a cover, which in this case is just CP1, so it's the simplest possible Bergman kernel. So it's independent of the teeth. It just looks completely magical that you can get maps out of this uh, so simple object. So, okay, now I'm writing xi as x of zi with i 1 and 2. And we just get, we need to add this shift that may look a bit mysterious at the beginning, but it's just something that we need and doesn't contribute at all at the level of combinatorics. But with that, we get the Bergman kernel here. So I don't know if this was denoted B in Bertrand's lectures, maybe. <coughs> but it's the same Bergman kernel as for many problems, as for the airy curve, for many things. And uh, it's just because uh, the spectral curve is of genus zero. So we just get that one, and uh, it's uh, the fundamental differential of the second kind on CP1. Uh, excuse me, Elba. So yes. far, did you put a dx1, dx2 in the definition of W02? Sorry? Was there a dx1, dx2 in your Ah, general? no, no. Yeah, thank you. This is very good. This is a mistake. The dx1, dx2 should be multiplying the W02, because the W02 is a function and we want it to be a different Thank you. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if I wanted to say something else. So yeah, this is very nice because usually this happens for many, many problems, as I was saying. You put here your combinatorial thing, you add this shift that does nothing combinatorially, and you always get the same thing. So from the same thing, if you know the x, you can now get many different numbers for topology 0, 2, just from the same type of object. Okay. So I will not say more about this because Bertrand already said a lot about the general Bergman kernel. And by the way, this is something that you need to prove. It's not uh, trivial at all that this is true. You need to prove it also using a touch recursion. But I will skip that thing because I think it's more, it's better if we see the details of the stable topologies. Maybe I will skip that. Uh, because with this, you can learn a lot of particular tricks for, for a specific case, but that are useful in any case of topological recursion. Higher or stable topologies. OK, so what happens here? We already hinted in here that the natural, natural objects are not functions, they are differentials. So let's define them in, in general, even if you already saw them, and you can maybe guess them for uh, higher g and n, but I will write them here. So for any g and n, the natural objects are defined on sigma, so on the cover. And they are what we call the omega GNs. And they are equal to WGNs of X1, Xn. Again, I'm using that the Xi is X of Zi now, because now we know what X is. So I can do this. Multiply it by DX1, DXN. And then for 
uh, base topologies, we need these little shifts. This one is the, this guy in here. Yes. But uh, turned into a differential, and then we need the shift for zero two that I just talked about. Are there questions, by the way? Maybe it's been a long time. I don't ask for questions. Good. Um, yes, so now I will state some things that you can get from that recursion and that I will use to prove the topological recursion. So that recursion implies that the omega GNs are symmetric. They are symmetric meromorphic differentials. That they are skew symmetric. This you can get by induction on the topologies. I will not do it, but uh, it's easy. You can again get it from the recursion. Ah, yeah, I already said that. Okay, what do I mean by, by skew symmetric? I just mean that if we change this to the, to the guy with the um, omega, we just get a minus sign. And well, this is just one over z one in this case. And the last thing is the pole structure. But you also have to believe me that it's not difficult to prove from the recursion, and maybe this you already saw in general in Bertrand's lecture for some cases. So you can imagine that. Um, I think you, you saw it in Bertrand's lecture for loop equations in general. And this is a particular case, so it should be the same type of technique. So the, for stable topology, so for 2G minus 2 plus N positive, we have that uh, the omega g ends have poles only at the ramification points. Okay? Nice. So now we are ready to do the final proof. Hopefully, let's see how it goes. Okay. So the first thing that we want to use is just Cauchy formula. So something very easy. So we will just be using some uh, tricks from complex geometry, but really elementary ones. So Cauchy tells us that we can write this as a residue at z equals z1. We add this simple pole, just because we want to recover this guy. And we just put this guy in here. OK, but now it turns out that we are in a compact Riemann surface. So we have that the sum of residues of a one form has to be equal to 0. Right? This is another classical thing. So for any p in the Riemann surface, actually, this will just contribute for poles. And uh, there are finitely many poles. And this is a finite sum. The sum of uh, residues is equal to 0. You probably use this trick even for exercises with uh, in Bertrand's course. Uh, if this is a meromorphic one form. On the Riemann surface. Then from this, we can just look at the other poles of this thing. And the other poles, we just said this has no more poles. And we just said that this has only poles at plus and minus 1. So this is equal to the residues and plus and minus 1 of minus this. Okay? So we just take 
I'm just reversing the sign in the denominator. We just take this. Now we use something very easy. We just use that actually our ramification points um, have this property. So we can actually sum another term like this with one over z and uh, they will have the same residue because we are taking residues at these points. Okay, so we can sum them and divide by two. Okay, so we do this. And I still have one whiteboard, very nice. Um, so now I want to use Q symmetry. So, okay, just by Q symmetry here, we will just be able to write this guy again like this, so with Z, but we have to change the sign here. So, this is just what I'm doing now. Yeah, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry, I'm making a mess with the differentials. Yes. So okay, we have the dz inside in here. So this is what dz1. And uh, here, where did the dz1 go? I just didn't write it. Okay. But now, observe that this thing is something very familiar. It's already, okay, maybe let me just not write the whole thing. But I will just write the thing inside the residue is just this integral of the Bergman kernel with respect to one variable of the Bergman kernel. Okay. Is it okay? Other questions? No? And now we need to use touch recursion. And it's a pity that it's not there in the blackboard, but hopefully it's in someone's notes, or you can remember more or less the shape. So I want to substitute now this guy with the other thing on the, on the side of the, so the, the right-hand side of the touch recursion. And we need to use, of course, that we have transformed in the touch recursion the functions to differentials according to this formula. Okay, so this is uh, important. So this is what we will do. This is a bit uh, awful to write. Um, so yeah, maybe I will just write it and then try to justify everything. And unfortunately it will not fit in here. Because I uh, remember that the touch recursion has quite some terms. So, okay, this looks like this. You can maybe already start checking like all the signs and everything. 
if you have the touch recursion in front of you or remember the shape. So I'm putting here first the polynomial. I'm turning everything into differentials. Remember, this was the polynomial, so I have to add all these the x's. Maybe I will not write more here because I will do manipulations on the formula le later. It's nice to see this. <laughs> but maybe this we don't need. Okay, maybe we can already make it fit not too badly in there. So there are more terms. Um, So I'm using now this notation to mean uh, Z2, Zn without Zi, okay, is it big enough? You seem fine. Uh, so and now here dx to the square, well maybe This is that two that end, remember. Okay, these guys come from the differential term of the touch recursion, and then I'm adding the terms that will stay there, that are the topological recursion terms. So here I'm writing no disk, and it's because I removed the disk from there and I put it on the other side of the equality. Remember that in the touch recursion uh, there was no, no disk. We also had that topology included. Okay, yes, so, okay, let's comment a little bit. It's not so bad. Uh, we just substituted this guy by the WGN times dx1, dxn, and with this shifts for 0, 1, and 0, 2, um, then used touch recursion. So remember that in touch recursion you had this type of guys, I was saying, but here you also had disks. So we took the disk term from the touch recursion, we put it on the other side, and we combined it with the term from touch recursion that had W and V prime. And uh, because there is this combination, that gives you exactly the omega zero one from the denominator in here. Yes, just remember that, well, you need to use also skew symmetry, so it's a bit uh, tricky, but not too much. Hopefully, remember that this is uh, just equal to this. Okay? And then, uh, well, maybe we also want to remember that this is equal to this. know how many poles this has. Sorry if this is getting a bit too smashed. So which other subtleties are there? 
not many more. So there are some other subtleties that I'm completely putting under the carpet. So these guys I'm not treating at all. Uh, so for special topologies, I think uh, 0, 3 and 1, 1, because it's where these guys will appear in here, as uh, accompanying the other one. Uh, we also have to treat those, uh, those special things, but they will never contribute to the residue. So I'm not even writing them in this generic formula. Let's say that this formula is for generic DNN. If you have a small DNNs, there are some extra terms that you also need to eliminate. But okay, now I will eliminate all the terms that are not there, and we need to justify why. So at least uh, I will do it for the generic case, and believe me that the other cases are easier. So if you are caref careful enough, you should be able to complete everything um, with the tricks that I'm going to show. So we have to change the signs, because we don't like this sign, so I will do it with red. Hopefully it's not too confusing for the online people. I'm just changing signs everywhere. So I want to turn this into a plus. Oh, sorry, not this one. So we will have a minus appearing here. What else do we want to do? We want to use skew symmetry. in some places. And I was saying that this already looks a lot like topological recursion, but still we want that this is equal. And if I want to be consistent with the color, so everything is correct, picking the right color, of course, the right uh, color with color, this guy, we just write it like this by skew symmetry. So we get exactly this guy that appears in topological recursion. Here we do exactly the same. So we are also rewriting this term over here as the same first guy. So the same sum, the same first guy. And in the second guy, well, it's not important at all that it's the second one, but in one of the guys, this will just be 1 over z. And just changes the sign. And again, we get the, exactly the, the term from topological recursion. So what do we have left? We just need to eliminate everything else. So let's do it. We How to do this? So in here, we have to check which are the zeros, okay? Because we need to compute the residue, remember. So this has, oh, this blue is not, maybe not working very nicely, but if I do it in uh, black, I think it's gonna be terrible. So this guy has a simple zero, no, no, sorry, a simple pole at z equals the ramification points because this guy has a double pole and we take the integral Oh, sorry, no, this is not what I'm saying. I'm saying that this guy has a simple zero just because of this integral. This guy will be equal to this guy, okay? So it's a simple zero. And now I'm talking about zeros at z equals plus and minus one. So I will not write it all the time, okay? But this is what I mean by simple zero. Then where else do we have this type of things? Well, this guy has a double zero. Why? Because this guy has a zero and this guy has a zero as well. Okay? So, this guy has a double, okay, this is probably very bad. <laughs> There's no hope to do it in blue. It's a double zero at those guys, plus and minus one. Then this term over here has contains the x to the square. 
So it has a double zero at the ramification points. So since this has a double zero, this has a simple zero, and the denominator has a double zero, it will not contribute to the residue. Okay, because remember that to the residue we only want things that have a simple uh, pole, right? So okay, this guy goes away. Maybe I just cross them with red. This term goes away. Then the next term, this, is, this one is a bit tricky. I think it's uh, maybe the trickiest, but uh, this one is very easy. It's just the same reason as before. This has a double zero. So this one doesn't contribute. And now for the other one, let me do it apart. Maybe, maybe I can do it here. Remember, we just need this one. When we have this one, uh, when, when we are convinced that that one doesn't contribute, we already have the formula of the topological recursion. Okay, so remark. The kernel of the topological recursion I remember what the kernel is, but you see it already there. And so this is the topological recursion kernel, and from its shape, it's clear that we can change z to one over z. And it stays the same. Why? Because if we change z to 1 over z in the numerator, we just change the sign. And if we do it here, we also change the sign in both. So it's good. We have the same. And then, OK, I still need a big thing. Um, yeah, I was hoping to not have to remove this. Maybe I will just remove everything from here, but I will leave the beginning. So second part of the remark. Well, this guy, the residue of that guy is equal to zero. The residue of that guy times the recursion kernel is equal to zero. Why? Well, it's very easy, but let's do it. Times that guy. OK, so we use the same trick as before. This is the same as changing, uh, so the residue will be the same if we change z to 1 over z everywhere. But if we change z to 1 over z here and here, that stays the same. So the only thing that changes is this one. So we can take those two guys and take the half of it, and we will get what we want. So we get uh, the thing that stays the same. And we get multiplied by this guy plus this guy with 1 over z, and the same in here. But now we know that this guy is Q-symmetric. So this is just equal to 0. So it's not even that it doesn't contribute to the residue. Well, it is, it is, because we used the residue here. So this just gives zero by skew symmetry. And we finished. We are able to kill our last guy, our, our last non-topological recursional guy. So we just got the formula of topological recursion, which is this term and this term. 
the residue of the kernel in here is equal to omega d n. So we finished. Okay. Are there questions? No? <laughs> now I'm not very sure if uh, you are all very tired or you are understanding everything. Probably the second one. <laughs> okay, so let's talk a little bit about our last part. The dual problem. Mm. So I will just start telling you about uh, this general property or conjectural property of topological recursion, which is uh, symplectic invariance. Because I think Bertrand didn't really mention this. And this is uh, one of our motivations. Like uh, understanding what Symplectic, the most complicated case of symplectic invariance means, which I think the full understanding of this is still open. So this was one of the motivations to define these fully simple maps, not the only one. So now I call it like the dual problem of ordinary maps because of this reason, but also because of some other reasons. Uh, it's an interesting uh, phenomenon. So symplectic invariance of, of TR. Maybe I, ju I will just give you the simplified version because uh, it's a bit late and uh, probably you're all a bit tired. So if we take a spectral curve, okay, this is a bit uh, simplified. I'm just taking the Riemann surface and X and Y. We apply the topological recursion. We get the omega g n, and we get our FGs that were defined by Bertrand, and they are just the omega g zero. They are numbers. Well, actually, in the case of maps, they are like um, rational functions on the t's. So they depend on the parameters on the moduli of the curve. They are not just complex numbers. But okay, in principle, morally, they are numbers because they don't have x's. Then we take here a symplectic transformation. What do we mean by this? We just mean that we take a transformation of x and y that preserves dx wedge dy. Well, actually, up to a sign if you want to make it a bit simpler even. Then we get here like the same Riemann surface and uh, the transform thing that has the same wet uh, dx dy. We apply topological recursion, we get the omega gn that I call omega gn wet. Okay, we get the wet numbers And what symplectic invariance tells us is that, in principle, these two numbers should be the same. Okay? And this is true for many symplectic uh, transformations. So actually, for all of them that don't involve changing x and y. As you can imagine from the topological recursion procedure, exchanging x and y is a really cumbersome transformation. So it's already very interesting that there is actually something going on. This has many physical motivations, so maybe, yeah, maybe I will just not talk about this. I'm not going to justify that it, this is fine for the other transformations, but believe me that it's uh, true. So for this one, uh, the one that I call E from extent, um,
this is not well understood. So they are expected to be equal up to some corrections that are not very well understood. And actually, personally, I don't care too much right now about which are the, the specific corrections. I care more about understanding what is going on, what is the phenomenon that is going on. This has many physical motivations. Probably Bertrand can tell you much more about that. Um, like has to do with background independence. It has to do with uh, the fact that exchanging X and Y in the quantum course makes some sense from the physical point of view. It has to do with many things, but it's quite surprising and quite strong. You can use it to prove strong things. Okay, now I promised that I would justify why I'm calling fully simple the dual problem of maps. Well, actually, if you just take the uh, spectral curve of maps, so x, the x that we saw, y, well, let me call it w, but it's re very related to the y. Or you can think it's just the y, to simplify a little bit. It's just the generating series of disks. We apply the topological recursion. We just proved this is one of the problems that satisfies topological recursion from the origin of topological recursion. But we just proved in these lectures that this satisfies topological recursion if this is the generating series of maps. Okay, and now what happens if we extend x and y? Well, you can probably guess. One nice thing is that this uh, result that I'm going to state now is now a theorem. It has a bit uh, long history. At the beginning, it was proved using symplectic invariance, but not everything was justified there. So then it turned into a conjecture again. But now it's finally proved again. So hopefully it will not turn into a conjecture anymore. And it just tells us that if we take the curve extending x and y, we apply the topological recursion, we get the wet omega g ends. We have to divide by the coordinate associated now to the new x. Here we get fully simple maps. This is the generating series of fully simple maps that I wrote yesterday. S stands for fully simple. Okay, so this is uh, quite nice. But let me tell you what happens. Okay, what are the base cases of this theorem? And then maybe a nice exercise if you want to understand a bit how these combinatorial maps work is play with these base cases because they are easy to prove. I mean, this is easy to prove from combinatorial transformations. Cylinders is already not so easy. But, uh, okay, disks is actually a nice exercise, so maybe we we can propose it as an exercise for tomorrow. These two generating series, generating series of fully simple disks and of disks are inverses of each other, which looks a bit surprising because fully simple disks are like many less than disks, but they are inverses of each other. So this was the first phenomenon that we observed and that told us that this is probably an interesting problem because maybe there is a chance that this is the problem that goes in here if you extend x and y. And also, this is some important formula that you find in something called free probability, which is some, 
well, in free probability, you, you, you take the notion of classical independence of random variables, you turn it into some, something called freeness. And this freeness is especially well suited to study non-commutative probability spaces. This is in very few words, more or less, what free probability is about. And in free probability, you find this formula that is very important. So it also told us, OK, maybe this has to do something with this nice phenomenon from free probability. So now, if we set xi to be just this guy, we can write what happens for cylinders. And you get also formulas from free probability that actually people in free probability were very surprised to see that with the intuition from topological recursion, this has a kind of obvious way of writing them in this symmetric way. They thought it was impossible to write their, their formulas in a symmetric way. But this is uh, Bertrand's uh, trick of writing everything with differentials and things get more natural. So this is just the formula that you get. These two things are the same. And of course, this is something that we wanted to even be able to state the, the conjecture because uh, this is the base case for disks. Because as I told before, the Bergman kernel is a universal object. And you get here that in the z variable, so if you take the axis that we, we showed before, this is just the Bergman kernel in both cases. Oh, sorry, maybe you were saying that you cannot see here? OK. So I just wrote that this is equal to the Bergman kernel. in both cases, and with the right coordinates. So again, from the same Bergman kernel, if you have the right transformation for the x, you can extract very different numbers, ordinary cylinders and ordinary fully simple uh, cylinders. OK? And now I can just sketch the relation, how to relate one problem to the other using Orbit numbers. So it's very convenient that we had Danilo's lecture before mine because now I can use the power of uh, orbit numbers without having to define them. Yeah, sorry. No, not at all. It's not obvious at all. It's what we wanted to show. Actually, so this, that the fact that this is equal to the Bergman kernel is what is shown for the ordinary cases that I, that I explained, no? So we wanted, I mean, our intuition was telling us that for this problem, if you take the same kind of expression, but with the other problem, so with the other variable and with the other generating series, here we should get the same Bergman kernel for the z's. This is what we wanted to prove. So actually I am writing this equality, but we wanted to prove that this is equal to this. Because then, really, when you exchange x and y here, everything makes sense. You get here the usual Bergman kernel for CP1, and you get here the usual Bergman kernel for CP1. So it's, it's crazy that the Bergman kernel is the same, just for completely different problems. And of course, to extract the same numbers, you have to change the meaning of the things. You change the meaning of the generating series, and you change what this guy is. This is uh, topological recursion. Here you're changing 0, 1, and here you're changing the meaning of your, what you want to count. But in the z variable, they have the same shape. Or the 
King of Two and show that he is the king. Uh, I mean, what powers from what? Uh, yes. So I guess this is what we wanted to prove, this equality. And to prove it, we decompose ordinary maps into fully simple pieces, combinatorially, and we show this equality. And since we know that this is equal for ordinary to this, then we show that this is equal to this, and we prove what we wanted. But yeah, thank you for the questions. This is actually something very surprising. So it's nice to, to comment on it. So over with numbers. <coughs> so remember from Danilo's lecture that this is the conjugacy class in uh, DL, where L is the size of the partition. So it's just the sum over all parts of this partition. This was denoted like partition of L in Danilo's talk. Just to remember some notations. OK. So this is the conjugacy class of cycle type lambda inside the symmetric group on L elements. OK, then we define, but uh, I'm going to rely on the fact that you already know about this a little bit. We define double Hurwitz numbers. You saw in Danilo's talk, I think, simple Hurwitz numbers. Now we want to fix two ramification profiles. So we are just defining this as the number of covers in which we fix two ramification profiles, the ramification profile over 0 and over infinity. The one over 0 is given by lambda. The 1 over infinity is given by mu. Here we will have some genus that we know how to compute. Well, even some connected components, because this is disconnected. And well, this is just the number of these coverings, the ramified coverings of the sphere. And we also allow simple ramifications in other points. And we know how many of the simple ramifications are. They are all related by the riemann horvitz formula that Danilo presented. They are k of them. So we can also count this using the symmetric group, as you also saw in Danilo's talk. So this is just the same as the to tuples of permutations. We take sigma to be of cycle type given by lambda. We take the tau i's of v, uh, being uh, just transpositions, so of cycle type 2, 1, 1, 1, 1. And we take that the product of these guys has to be of cycle type mu. OK, so this is the definition of Hurwitz numbers. There are also some automorphisms that I'm not going to talk about at all. But remember, then I can state the theorem and we can finish here. So the theorem will tell us how these two problems are related. Oh, this is the bad one, via Hurwitz numbers. Maybe tomorrow we can, whoever feels like, can deduce some things from this relation. But the fact that these two problems can be related with these Hurwitz numbers is also what is making me right now call them dual problems related to, to other things that I'm not really going to discuss, but OK. Ah, OK, so I have to say, that's why I said uh, that they are also this. I have to say what I mean. <laughs> Just uh, briefly, if we write the transpositions like this, and we have that the, sorry, the bi are increasing, but weakly increasing, then we call this weakly monotone. And we denote them just like this. And if it's strictly, then it's strictly monotone. And we denote them just with a strictly uh, smaller or equal sign. 
So we just need this guy, and then I'm able to state the theorem and finish here. This is just L factorial over the number of guys in that uh, uh, conjugacy class. The theorem tells us that you can go from one problem to the other using these two problems, these two Hurwitz problems. So generating series of maps of fixed lengths given by a, a partition lambda. And we are treating the disconnected case because the formula is nicer. We need this z, the zeta that I defined here. That is just some kind of automorphism factor. And we take the sum over partitions. We take the sum over all possible k's. n to the minus k. Remember that n was this guy that was kind of adjusting the topology. Here we find strictly monotone Hurwitz numbers. And on the other side, we arrive to fully simple numbers. And the opposite formula, you can, once you find one, you can find the other one very easily if you understand how the Hurwitz problems are related. Naturally, nowadays, there are three proofs of this uh, theorem. And each proof gives us different information. At least there are combinatorial proofs of the first guy because you don't have any minus sign and when you don't have minus signs you do combinatorics. You can do bijective combinatorics and prove this. But this is not how we discovered the relation. We discovered it with the second one using matrix models. And uh, the power of Weingarten calculus that helps us compute unitary moments of unitary um, so moments over the unitary uh, matrices. And here, on the other side, we find ordinary maps. So OK, I just repeat the idea. We can go from ordinary maps to fully simple maps using strictly monotone Hurwitz numbers, and the other way around, from fully simple to ordinary using weakly monotone Hurwitz numbers. Yes. Well, thank you.